My pleasure to introduce uh, Werner Saylor, who will talk about singularities of algebraic differential equations today. Uh, Werner, please. Okay, thank you, Clip, and also all the other organizers for inviting me here today for this talk. Um, it's work I've done together on one hand with my postdoc, Matthias Seiss, but also together with Markus lange Hegermann and Daniel Roberts. And you will see some references later. My experience with this topic is uh, that I first must always clarify about what I'm speaking not or not speak. Um, the term singular is really overloaded in mathematics. And so um, many different meanings of singularities in the context of differential equations are around. Most of them refer actually to singularities of individual solutions. And that's not what I will speak about. I will really speak about singularities of a differential equation. I will explain in the talk what this is. What is closest to what we are mean, meaning is to perhaps this classical thing that a lot of people call stationary points of vector fields, um, also singularities. And what is happening here? If you look at the distribution generated by the vector field, or these vector spaces you get at every point, they're almost everywhere one dimensional, but at a stationary point, suddenly the dimension of this vector space jumps. And that's a bit what will happen uh, when we discuss um, singularities. We have a geometric model of differential equations. We have certain geometric structures on them. And at some points, certain dimensions may jump. Oops. The whole thing is part of a larger project where we want to combine three things. And maybe I start a bit in the middle. The framework we are using is essentially something that's classical um, in differential topology, where such notions of singularities of differential equations have been defined. For example, I think most prominent is Vladimir Arnold uh, and his books, where one can find such things. Um, we want to make these things also effective. And that's then, for example, where commutative, but also differential algebra comes into the game. We want to define and detect singularities of arbitrary systems of ordinary and partial differential equations. And once we have got these uh, singularities uh, that will not be covered in the talk today, we want to answer classical questions an analyst might have. Such a point on a differential equation you might interpret as initial conditions that you specify an initial value problem. And then one can ask all the usual questions. Do solutions exist? Are they unique? Actually, typically they will be non-unique. What about their regularity and so on? So we want to interpolate a bit between differential topology differential algebra and classical analysis. So I should start by saying, what is a differential equation for us? As I said, we want to have a geometric model for that. And as we aim in direction of analysis, we restrict our base fields either to the real numbers or the complex numbers. And you may now consider smooth or analytic maps um, Strictly speaking, they are always defined locally on some open set. But during the talk, to keep the notation down, I will always omit these local things. I will use a more global notation, but everything is to be understood locally. So you can uh, look here at maps from Kn to Km. And the chat bundle, as perhaps many of you know, they just exploit that for such maps, you can write down Taylor polynomials. You fix a certain degree of it, and then you consider functions which at the same evaluation point x dot, and if you use the same degree L of the Taylor polynomials, give you the same Taylor polynomials. Such functions you consider as equivalent, and then the set of all equivalence classes you get that way that uh, defines a chat bundle. Such an equivalence class is called a chat. Um, it's not difficult to show that that way you get a manifold. And 
because I was work, I'm assuming the simple case that we have maps from Km to Km, actually this jet bundle is still an affine space of some dimension, which you obtain uh, with an elementary combinatorial computation. And the local coordinates are of course just your independent variables, your dependent variables or unknown functions and all derivatives of the dependent variables with respect to the independent variables up to the given order L. And uh, we have this order of the chat bundle as a parameter. Of course, we can play here a bit. And if you go to a higher order, then of course you have natural projections to lower order by simply forgetting the highest terms in your Taylor polynomials. And of course, you may also forget everything except the expansion point. That's also a vibration we will need a few times. So that's my notation. If you jump between two fixed orders, and this is my notation if you uh, project down to the base space. Um, I, I said here, this is like an affine space. Now, of course, in an affine space, all variables are on an equal footing. I mean, in the standard affine space you might use in uh, algebraic geometry, doesn't matter what is x1, what is x2, what is x3. But here you see we have different types of variables. And so somehow, of course, we also must model this. This is what in the geometric theory of differential equations one calls a contact structure. And the simplest and also for our purposes, the most convenient way um, to do this is to describe it by a distribution. You simply write down certain vector fields on the chat bundle. And the key ones are these. Um, if you look at them carefully, if you can read all the indices and so on, then actually this vector field does nothing but to encode uh, the chain rule. Um, if you think of u as a function of x, and similarly all the derivatives of fun as function of x, and you do a total derivative with respect to x, then you would exactly use this kind of operation uh, according to the chain rule. The only difference is in the chain rule, well, you can also always add one more uh, order of derivative but here we have a fixed order, fixed maximum order L. So for that reason, this vector field in some sense stops one order too early. That's why here we only differentiate with respect to the derivative with less than order L. And we simply add all vector fields in the direction of the highest order derivatives. And uh, with these vector fields, I I have not the time to go into details. You can really encode uh, the different types of variables you have. Okay, so what is now a differential equation? In the classical geometric theory, you see this answer here. You look at a fibered submanifold and you look at the image of this uh, submanifold under this projection to the base space. Or actually, you look at this restricted projection, you require that is a subjective submersion. Here, perhaps a few comments are in order. The first thing is to clarify a bit terminology. In the geometric theory, you never distinguish between scalar equation and systems. So when I speak of a differential equation, actually most of the cases, um, a system will be behind it. The differential equation is simply the submanifold. What its co-dimension is uh, doesn't matter. Um, the main problem with this definition is if we stick to it, we can end the talk right now because uh, this definition um, forbids all kinds of singularities that I want to discuss. As a simple example, one can look at differential equation of this type and they frequently appear in applications. Quasi-linear systems, in here, it's just a single equation, but also whole systems. And you have a matrix there in front, which depends on X, maybe also on U. And here you see, for example, the projection is not surjective. 
you will not get the point x equals zero. So this, this would be forbidden by this definition. Similarly, if you look at something like this, which would correspond to the unit sphere in the jet bundle, at the equator, you don't have a submersion. So again, uh, would be forbidden. But exactly this kind of equations we want to study. So we have to relax uh, the assumptions a bit or the requirements. And simultaneously, I said already, that's not really a definition with which you can work effectively. So we want something that we can effectively describe. So we move a bit more in the direction of algebraic geometry. We first define the notion of an algebraic jet set. This is a locally Tsarisky closed subset of the jet bundle. So uh, in simpler words, just a difference of two varieties. And such an algebraic jet set, we call algebraic differential equations. If um, yeah, we look again at this image under this projection, but now we do not require that the projection is subjective. We only require that we get the whole space space if we use the Euclidean closure. So we have considerably relaxed conditions. And now, for example, equations like this are no problem. They fit perfectly into this uh, framework. By speaking about the risky closed subsets, we have restricted to equations with polynomial nonlinearities. But that's rather naturally if you want to do effective computations. And what about this difference of two varieties? Well, it simply means that we allow that our systems comprise equations and inequations. That's also included here. You may wonder why one has conditions like this or before the surjective. It has a very simple reason. If you just speak about submanifolds, or varieties, they could be defined by equations like this, but that's not what you would consider as a differential equation, because x should be the independent variable. So we must somehow exclude such things which are definitely not differential equations. And that's exactly what these kind of conditions are achieving. Okay, I still have to meet an engineer that comes to me and tells me I have this wonderful locally Tsarisky closed subset of a chat bundle. I mean, that's not the way how anybody in application thinks. People in application, they really come with what I will now call in this talk systems. So what is for us a differential system? We will assume that we have differential polynomials. And for simplicity, I simply assume that we have uh, rational functions as coefficient field. And we have on one hand, with one set of these polynomials, we define inequations, and with the other subset, we define inequations. Um, rational functions are also a bit cumbersome to work with. So in practice, we actually assume that everything is of a polynomial dependency, also of x. And of course, once we have achieved or reached this subring d, we can truncate it at a, some order of derivatives. And now we have really a polynomial ring with finitely many uh, variables. And this polynomial ring is, of course, nothing else than the coordinate ring of this affine space, which we identified uh, with our chat bundle. So here we see already a bit connections, how we can relate things. And so indeed, the question is now, assuming this engineer is coming with this differential system, how do we get an algebraic chat set out of that? Okay, the first thing is that we have to choose some order L in which we want to work. And then there's a very natural way how to do it. You take the equations um, in your system and you look at the differential ideal generated by them. Then you truncate it at this given order. So now you have obtained an algebraic ideal. For the inequations, okay, we take only those into account um, of a suitable order. So they should have an order less or equal to L. We take the product of all of them and look at the principal ideal generated by this. 
And then our algebraic chat set is simply the difference between the varieties we get from these algebraic ideas. Now, this is a very natural thing to do, but as it's so often with such natural things, it has its problems. Um, I have not really the time to discuss this in much detail. I mean, in our paper, we have spent several pages on really explaining this with examples and so on. The first problem is that these ideals are often too small. For example, you do not get automatically radical ideals. Then I wrote here, this is a chat set. It's not necessarily a differential equation. That's the problem. Then again, this ideal, it's not so clear how you could actually compute a generating set for it. And finally, also the chat set we get at the end could be too small. This was something, once you know it, it's quite easy why this happens. But at the beginning, uh, it took us a while to really realize this. Assume you have a very simple inequation. U prime is not zero. That's part of your system. If you think of this inequation differentially, it just tells you, you should not be the constant function. That's the only thing. If U prime is not the zero function, you cannot be a constant function. But if you now, and that's what actually happens in this procedure, consider this u prime as an algebraic, u prime not equal zero as an algebraic inequation, you eliminate in the chat bundle all points where the u prime coordinate is zero. So for example, all points that correspond to a maximum or minimum of a solution. So it's suddenly a much stronger condition that u prime is unequal zero. And that uh, eliminates part uh, that, we would like to have. So this is a little bit um, too simple, this construction. But actually, the proper construction is not uh, much more difficult. The basic point is we should um, look a bit at our starting point. I leave out at uh, this part of the talk an exact definition of what I mean by a simple differential system, because that's a bit technical. So I have some slides on that. We can discuss it perhaps after the coffee break. What we are using here is a theory of the Thomas decomposition. And there, such a notion of simple differential systems appear that comes from the theory of triangular systems, but also another, uh, another nice things like it's, uh, you have looked for integrability conditions and so on. And so we assume that we have a simple differential system. And the theory guarantees us that this is not a restriction. Arbitrary differential systems can always be decomposed in a disjoint union of finitely many simple differential systems. So with the preprocessing, we can always assume that we have simple differential systems. And then we only have to do one mo tiny modification when we generate our differential ideal, we have to do a saturation with respect to the product of the initials and the separates. Otherwise, we follow exactly the recipe I outlined before. But now things become much nicer. The differential ideal we obtain is automatically radical. Daniel Roberts has this, for example, in his book. It essentially goes back to, I think, a differential algebra well-known uh, result by Lazam. Because of some of the conditions imposed on simple differential system, it's now straightforward um, to really compute explicit basis of these ideals. That's not a big deal anymore. In getting the simple differential system, you have already done all the necessary computations. And the final point is um, you have natural relations if you do the same construction in different orders, L or maybe some order L plus K bit higher, you get essentially the same. These are the results project on each other. And a general problem when you look about uh, um, such geometric objects is um, how much of this object is really relevant? Um, for example, symmetry theory, it's quite well known. 
if people are a bit careless and have ignored integrability conditions, then considerably parts of uh, the manifold or variety is not relevant because no solution will ever go through points there. So we call the algebraic differential equation locally integrable if we have a, a risky open and dense subset such that to each point in the subset, we have at least one prolonged solution going through it. So that really solutions see this part. And um, our construction automatically produces such things. In fact, what we can do at this stage is we simply ignore the inequations that correspond that we take the Tsariski closure of the chat that we have just constructed and we then automatically get a locally integrable algebraic differential equation, not just a chat set, but really a differential equation. So this construction gives us really something good. Okay, so slowly I should zoom in on singularities as is in the title of my talk. I need one more slide to prepare. I said at the very beginning, on these uh, geometric models for the differential equations or algebraic differential equations, we want to have certain geometric structure. And the main structure we are using is what we call the Vesio comb or the Vesio distribution. In the Russian literature one also often speaks of Carton cone, Carton distribution, we attribute it to Vesio. So what is this about? At the beginning, I introduced this contact distribution, the distribution that tells you what is the role of the different types of variables. So at each point in the chat bundle, and thus, of course, also on each point on our chat set, we have a vector space generated by these contact vector fields. We can now look which of these uh, vector fields are tangential to our algebraic chat set. One question here is now, of course, what does tangential mean here? Recall, we are speaking about varieties. And for some reason, again, I will not discuss it uh, extensively here. We prefer the tangent cone. We don't use uh, the linear tension space, but we prefer the tangent cone. And that way we speak of a Vestio cone. So we just intersect the contact distribution with a um, tension cone at this point. In fact, for most of this talk, I will just speak about smooth points on the chat set. And then of course, there's no difference. Uh, of course, then the tension cone is just the ordinary tension space. So also the Vesio cone becomes a Vesio space and it's straightforward to compute it as a solution space of a linear system of equation. Within the Vesio cone, we look at the subcone, the symbol cone, these are just those vectors which are vertical for this projection. Um, if you go deeper into the geometric theory, the symbol is what distinguishes uh, typical PDEs and ODEs. For finite type systems, a symbol is a zero space. Whereas when you have infinite dimensional solution spaces like you typically have for PDEs, that exactly comes from the symbol. But I don't want to speak more about such things. I just want to give you motivation. Why should one look at the Vesio cone? You may consider subspaces of the Vesio cone as infinitesimal solutions or what uh, Elie Carton called integral elements. It's of course difficult to compute solutions of differential equations. I mean, everybody knows this. But one could try first to get tension spaces to graphs of solutions. And this is just what one considers as infinitesimal solutions. And these infinitesimal solutions, they automatically lie in the Vesio cone. So one could say it's the space of all potential infinitesimal solutions. And for that reason, it's of interest to look at. The point is now, we have such a cone at every um, point on our chat set. But as I said before, the dimensions of these cones can differ, can depend on the point, but also the orientation. So again, the orientation is now, how is this cone uh, lying in the full space? 
If you remember high school, when you were first introduced to derivatives, one of the first things you learned, okay, the tangent to a graph of a function can never be vertical. It must always be transversal. And that's exactly what is here also the meta of the value cone. How much of it is vertical and thus cannot be used for tension spaces and how much is transverse. Okay, so finally, um, really the definition of what we consider as singularities of differential equations. So as, as I said already a few times, we are working here with varieties, so we might have non-smooth points on this variety. This is what we call an algebraic singularity. I will not say much about them in this talk. And in fact, not that much is known about them. So let's concentrate on the smooth points on this variety. If you want to define singularities, this actually always means you should think very carefully about what you consider as being regular. So the most difficult part of this definition is what is a regular point? So what do we want to have at a regular point? So we have a smooth point on our algebraic differential equation. And if it is regular, the first thing we require is that we have a whole Euclidean neighborhood of this point on our differential equation, such that uh, the Vessio spaces or the Vessio distribution there is regular. That means no jumps in the dimension. At every point in the neighborhood, we also have the same dimension of the Vessio space. And furthermore, this Vessio distribution can be decomposed. We have the symbol distribution as the subdistribution. And then, of course, we need some complement. And this complement at a regular point has to uh, satisfy quite a number of conditions. The first is its dimension must correspond to the number of independent variables. If you think of the graph of a function depending on n variables, the tension space must be n-dimensional. And this H is a candidate for such um, tension spaces. And as I just said, it should be transversal. Otherwise, it cannot come from the graph of a function. And the final conditions are now concerned with the following. Um, so I have now a whole neighborhood. At each point, I have such nice transversal, right dimensional subspaces. Can I combine them to the tension space of really some surface? And this is only the case if you have an involutive smooth distribution. And this condition of being involutive, uh, we'll come a few times back to it, it's really a pain in your backside. That's what makes things really much more complicated. So these are the conditions for regular points. You'll see later this translates in kind of existence theorems. So we have essentially two conditions, the regularity of the Vessio distribution and this decom uh, possibility with this uh, transversal complement. At regular single points, the first thing still works. We still have a regular distribution, but the complement to the symbol is not big enough. Which automatically, by the way, means in such points, no solution can go through them. You cannot have solution there. At irregular singularities, you have already a problem with the first condition, which essentially means here the dimension of the Vessio distribution has jumped. You have a, a bigger Vessio distribution, a Vessio space, than at other points. Um, algebraic singularities can be straightforwardly detected with a Jacobian criterion, for example. That's a standard task in uh, algebraic geometry, so I won't speak about it. Um, the distinction between these three types of points, also if you if we ignore for a moment this condition of involutive, as I said, it always makes trouble, this condition. So let's ignore it for a moment. Then again, it's just a matter of analyzing a linear system of equation. 
You look at the linear system that defines the Vessio spaces and you look at it in the right way. Okay, now these conditions or these definitions have perhaps looked a bit complicated to you. In particular, if you have ever looked, say, in the book of Vladimir Arnold on ordinary differential equations, and have seen their definitions of regular singular and irregular singular points. They are much, much easier than what I gave you. What is the reason? Well, he considers only scalar ODEs, so what we call equations of finite type. Here the situation is much simpler. I know a priori what the right dimension of the Vessio space and so on of simple space, etc., should be. So I can point-wise just compare this dimension. There's no need to look at whole neighborhoods. That's what our definition makes so complicated. But in a PD, you don't know what is the right dimension. You have to look at a whole neighborhood and decide what is a generic behavior here. That's what this uh, complicated definitions are about. And because of these problems with this involutivity condition in this case, we are not yet sure that for PDEs actually um, this definition covers everything. For ODEs, they are generally finite type equations. You can really prove every point belongs uh, into one of these four categories. For PDEs, it could be that we have points that look like category two, but we are not able to prove the involutivity condition. And what's going on there is still a bit unclear. Okay. I don't know how useful such examples are, but just to show you that we are not speaking about empty sets here. This is an overdetermined system of PDEs. Um, it's a linear system, but with variable coefficients. And every case uh, of the definition appears in the system. Some case even uh, with different things, so that sometimes so you get a higher dimension here of the Vessio distribution. Here it's four dimensional. Now once again here. Here you see um, here suddenly you get five dimensional. So even different instances of the same case uh, may appear. So these things really appear in systems. And of course, the question is, uh, this will be answered in this talk, how can you actually get such a list. I mean, it's not so easy to compute all these. Um, but before I go to that, to that um, well, why do we care about this? So I should perhaps give you at least a bit indication what happens now at such singularities. Why are they singular in a very practical applied sense? This is best understood if we consider just real ODs. So in the standard existence and uniqueness theorem, Pika Lindelof, that probably all of you learned in some undergraduate courses on ODEs, you learned you always have a solution to both sides of your initial point. This is here, for example, not necessarily guaranteed. It could be that you have only one-sided solutions, something special that you have two-sided solutions. Then instead of the classical uniqueness, you might have multiple solutions. That could be that there are two, three, four solutions through a point to the singularity, but it could be that you have infinitely many solutions. And although, I mean, we are speaking about polynomials, so our equations are analytic. And normally an analytic ODE has always analytic solutions. But here it may happen that you have finite regularity. I will not go into details, but here just a simple example. It's uh, a semi-linear equation. So the singular thing is that we have this uh, factor X before the highest derivative. And okay, we have a non-linearity on the right-hand side, but uh, here we have some constant, which I've written in a somewhat a strange manner. Now, if you go to X equals zero, you can choose whatever value you want for u, as u doesn't show up in the equation. But for u prime, you have now two possibilities. It can be plus or minus k half, where we assume that k is positive. So let's look at this point with plus k half. 
So we pose the corresponding initial value problem. U of zero is C, U prime of zero is K half. Now, if K is an integer, we have what we call a resonance. We have infinitely many solutions, but all of them have only finite regularity. They're only K times differentiable. If K is not an integer, you have one smooth solution in an addition, infinitely many solutions of finite regularity. But if you just have cho had chosen instead of this plus K half minus K half, absolutely nothing is happening. You have just a standard result, a unique smooth solution goes through this point. So you see very tiny details of your equation um, matters here. And uh, it's very hard to predict without a deeper analysis what is really going on. Here are some colorful pictures. Um, I mentioned already before, we could look at um, a unit sphere in the chat bundle. And um, the curves you see here, this uh, curve there, they are prolonged solutions, or what we call generalized solutions. They're integral manifolds of the Vessier distribution. And they're perfectly smooth curves uh, going, uh, wandering over the whole sphere, easy to compute numerically instead of computing, trying to compute directly solutions. But if you project them down, right, and then you get the picture on the right-hand side, then you suddenly see that special things happen on the equator. If you look here, po point at the equator, two solutions start here, but no solution can go through this point. And similarly on the other side, two solutions end here. So these are regular singularities on the equator and we have two points, we always call them the East Pole and its antipode on the back, the West Pole, they're irregular singularities. And you have infinitely many solutions approaching them but never reaching them and without having a well-defined tension. Here you can see an example of an algebraic singularity, you simply take the standard cone when we have of course this vertex Yep, we really should speak about a Vessio cone. These are these white lines here. That's a Vessio cone. And the question is, do you have solutions that go through this vertex? And with some ad hoc analysis, you find that you have one analytic solution that stays on the lower uh, semicone and one analytic solution that stays on the upper semicone. But what you also can do is, you follow one of these analytic solution to the vertex, and then you simply jump to the other one. This gives you a C1 solution. It will not be C2, you can prove this, but it's still a valid strong solution. So here we have actually four solutions going through the origin, finite number. Well, this just as a few examples, what may happen here. Um, so, some results without going into too much detail. So, because so far I've given you only definitions essentially. The first thing, um, if you want to declare that something is singular, is you must show that it's rare. In finite dimensional system, that's trivial. So, nobody has ever bothered to write it up. But we also include equations of infinite type. And we can prove that indeed the regular points contain a Tsariski open and dense subset. The proof might look fairly small here on the slide, but I should say these items contain big parts of my habilitation thesis, complete theory of what Pomeroy bases have to do with resolutions of um, polynomial modules and so on. And the last point, for example, was a complete PhD thesis of a former student of mine. So you need some big machinery to do this. Um, in the classical literature, people just look at individual points. But when you go, as long as you do scalar ODEs of first order, that's fine. But if you go to larger systems, it doesn't suffice that you just speak about individual points. So we must define a bit more um, how we want to analyze equation. And that's where we have introduced this notion of a regularity decomposition. I think if I look at the time, I don't go into much detail. 
the basic idea is we want to have chat sets on which nothing happens, no dimension jumps and so on. That's what we call an algebraic chat set. And the point is now we define a regularity decomposition of a prime component of a chat set to be a representation as a disjoint union on one end of the set of algebraic singularities and on the other hand, of finitely many regular algebraic chat sets. When I give in freshman lectures such definitions, I always tell the students, this is like a Christmas wish list. We say it would be nice to have such things. And it's of course not so clear that you have them. And that's our second main result we can prove in an algorithmic and thus constructive manner that these things really exist. We can compute for any differential systems such uh, regularity decomposition. Again, I have a few slides with more details for discussions later, but here at the moment I just want to stick here. And I don't know, how much time do I have I still got? Yeah, I would say minutes or Maybe okay. Two, then I will out of time. Now this point about uh, regular equations. Yeah. Okay. No. Wait. No, I jumped too far. So I just want to give a brief outlook. Then at the end, um, I was a bit imprecise at the beginning and said, "Okay, we have work either over R or over C." But the theory of the machinery of Thomas decomposition actually requires an algebraically closed field. So strictly speaking, our algorithmic parts are restricted to the complex case. And so of course, an obvious question is to do something for real. For real equations also, you would extend to semi-algebraic equations that might include um, inequalities like um, U prime greater than zero, that kind of stuff. And one can do this, so that's already clear to some extent, by replacing Thomas decomposition by quantifier elimination. I already mentioned a few times the problem of uh, equations of infinite type and that not much is known about algebraic singularities. About this local solution behavior, what I indicated a little bit, for ODEs, that's not so difficult. You can do it with dynamical system theory. Well, not so difficult. You typically have stationary points which are not hyperbolic, and then it can become, by the way, quite unpleasant. Matthias Seiss uh, knows this quite well because it's usually his job to do the blowing up of the singularities and so on. We think that we can see an extension to PDEs of finite type, but uh, it's unclear how to go to PDEs of infinite type. And if you want to see the gory details. Well, most of what I spoke about was this paper that appeared last year. Uh, in this paper, you can read a bit uh, about the real case, uh, how one can do this with quantify elimination. And if you want to see a bit of the kind of results you get using dynamical system theory, you can look at this paper. Okay, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Werner. So we have time for a couple of quick questions. Just please unmute yourself and ask, or, or you can type in the chat and I will read your question. So I, I have a question, I'm not sure whether it's quick or not. So uh, there are examples where a formal power series solution of an ODE uh, diverges. Would this be a singularity in this sense or, or not? Um, again, you are thinking here of solutions, of individual solutions and not of the equation mm -hmm. itself. I mean, probably you are thinking of classical theory of linear ODEs, but again, with such a leading coefficient. So fuchs frobenius theory, and then instead of a power series, you go to a Frobenius series with logarithmic terms. Um, the precise relation of this theory to what we are doing is quite unclear. And as I said, actually one looks at different things. But say when there you say, say x equals zero is a, is a singular point, 
this also or the points above it in the chat bundle would be singularities in our sense. But here you can really see the difference in how we approach things and what, how things are approached there. We are interested in the solutions that really go through the singularity. So solutions they, that blow up, that might approach it, okay, some of them we see, we have seen that in the, uh, this example with the sphere, we had solutions that approach uh, the irregular singularity and they probably would be, well, some derivative would be, uh, yeah, some derivative would go to infinity there. But uh, we are really normally interested in having solutions that exist in this point, that do not diverge but they might not be representable by power series. So as I said, I had these results when we had solutions of finite regularity, then it makes no sense to speak about power series. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah. Yes, sorry. Oh. sorry, just go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, in when you define singular solution, it seems that it depends of some L, and I don't get it. Uh, yeah, it okay. seems it's not completely interesting. Yeah, it's, it depends on the on the L you have chosen on the cut you made. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So here I have again the slide with the definitions and there are a few points um, one can discuss here. The first thing, actually I even had it on this slide, but uh, didn't speak about it. There is some issue, what you consider as RL here. Again, that would be perhaps leading a bit too far. Um, how you choose your RL and uh, for example, how you classify points that might depend on that. Perhaps to give you at least one idea, you might know the Clairaut equation. That's a classical equation also often studied in differential algebra because you have a singular integral. And then it depends, do you keep the singular integral as part of the RL or not? You will get different uh, classification results. So that's one point already, what you really choose as your RL. That has a strong effect here. The definition I just said, okay, we have some RL given. Now coming back to your equation, uh, to your question. Um, when I, let's go yeah, back I here. When I described this construction, I just said, okay, you choose some order L. And Okay, classically, I would say you look a bit at your equations, uh, the inequations, and you choose an order that is higher than, or as high as, as the biggest thing you have got in your system. So that would be the, one of the most natural choice. And if you have the, this lowest reasonable order, if you find their singularities, and now you go say, well, what happens in order L plus one? you will find above these points, again, singularities. About regular points, these will be regular points. About singular points, there will be singular points. What is more difficult, um, we distinguish between regular and irregular singular points. And so uh, here things become more interesting. Above a regular singular point, you simply have no further points. That's what I said before, uh, there cannot be solutions through it and uh, you simply cannot produce the next term in a Taylor series. At irregular singular points, things are getting really difficult. You know, there are points above it. All these points are singular, but it's uh, unclear whether you can guarantee that you have again, irregular singularities. If you think, for example, you want to get a theorem that at an irregular singularity, you have a formal power series solution. Let's not bother about convergence, just to have the existence of a formal power series solution. Then within this approach, you actually should do exactly this. You look at uh, order L, then you look what happens order L plus one, L plus two, L plus three, L plus four. And you must show that in every order, you find irregular singularities or that form a tower above each other. If you can prove this, 
we have proven the existence of a formal power theory solution. But that can be quite difficult. And um, there's definitely no general results or theorems on this. So um, this question, what happens in prolongations, how we say, so when you go to higher order, it's really a good question. And there are quite a number of open questions there. So there's not a complete theory that tells you exactly what will happen. Thank you. Uh, hi, Rana. Um, William here. Uh, when you say involutive, um, are you using, let's say, Gertz definition for the algebraic system? I mean, okay, involutive is again a term. Well, um, the involutive that appeared in my talk so far, the involutive here, is involutive in the sense of differential geometry or the Frobenius theorem. Uh -huh. um, if you have two vector fields within this distribution, you require that their um, Lie bracket is still in this distribution. It's a kind of closure um, um, condition. So this is something more of a differential geometric notion. I think what you might be thinking of is a bit more um, hidden in, um, oh, where have I been? When I spoke about simple systems suddenly, on it here. In this uh, uh, concept of a simple system, also a notion of involutive is hidden. Here it's involutive in the sense of the Jeanne Ricci theory, in a differential algebraic sense. So here it's really in the sense of uh, a kind of absence of integrability conditions. Mm -hmm. completeness that you cannot produce, uh, yeah, something like integrability conditions. So it, it, it is not related to uh, Vladimir Gertz uh, evolutive for algebraic system? I mean, like in terms of from the basis, for example. I must admit, I don't know what they use for what they use in evolutive. Oh, they're, they're talking about genetic basis and things like that, right? Okay, if they speak about Jani basis, then um, that's the algebraic version of what you have for Jani Ricci systems. I mean, Jani Ricci originally formulated right. everything for differential equations, and then Vladimir Gatt translated this uh, into the purely algebraic case. But so, yes, that's an, uh, exactly the notion of Jani basis that's behind it, behind it's hidden in the simple here. Okay. Okay, good. So I think we can have more questions uh, after the breakout rooms. So yeah, Ronnie will create rooms now.